Let's look at six ways in which swords are kind of more important weapons than pole arms. Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatore. Now, I'm aware that uh, me and various other people in the sort of historical combat community here on YouTube have tried to bust that myth that uh, swords are the most awesomest weapons ever and actually pole arms like spears and bills and halberds and partisans and glaives and things like this are actually kind of more important on the medieval battlefield. And so you've got to bear in mind the context here is that we have been myth busting. But what we never want to do is overstate how important swords were in medieval warfare. They were incredibly important and I'm going to look at here six reasons why swords were so important on the medieval battlefield. But additionally, the final point, number six, is going to blow your mind uh, and really is the most important reason. Okay, so I'm going to look at five preliminary reasons which you may or may not have thought about. I may have covered in previous videos, but the sixth point is really the one you want to hang out for and is really the game changer and the reason why swords were so important. But before we go on, I want to have a quick word about our sponsors for this video who are Mech Arena. The mechs are finally here. Mech Arena is the new 5 versus 5 mech shooter game. Uh, and it's awesome, it looks great, it runs great, runs great on all platforms apparently, I play it on Android personally, runs super smoothly and it's a great game to duck in or out of, you don't have to play every day, free to download, free to play, uh, but it's a great casual game if you want to blast away at some robots. Here we go. Obviously it's really important to learn the strengths and weaknesses of your different mechs, what their particular um, skills are, what their particular weapons are, and play to those advantages. For example, the motorbike's great at ramming, not very strong at sustaining fire. Um, some of the mechs have got tons of armour. Um, and they've got different types of weapons, a sustained laser fire weapon and then you've got uh, shotgun weapons, machine gun type weapons and so on and so forth. So obviously using the terrain, using the obstacles, using the particular strengths and weaknesses of the different mechs is the way to win this game. Oh no! Oh, no! no! Oh. I couldn't get out of that laser beam. This one is like a motorbike that can ram people. It's pretty good. If you ram them, you do quite a lot of damage, but you have to succeed. No, I missed. Shoot, 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 shoot. No. So massive news is that Mech Arena has just launched globally now. So it is out there. You can go and download it right now. And they're also doing a celebration in-game event that's happening right now. In fact, there are loads of events going on and loads of free gifts. Now's a great time to join between the 9th and the 19th of August. So if you join now, you're going to be super powerful for the people who join after that. So as mentioned, Mech Arena is completely free to play, free to download. You can use my description. You can play it on Android or iOS. You can use my description in the link below this video or the QR code which you can see on screen right now. And if you do this, you will get one millispec skin, 500 A coins, 70,000 credits to help kickstart your game. If you're quick enough, you can add me to your friends. My name on their username is Context. And uh, yeah, we can play some games together. Even if I do suck quite badly at the moment, I'm trying my best to learn. So go and give it a go right now. So thanks a lot for sticking with me. Now let's get back to the main topic of this video, which are essentially why were swords so important on the medieval battlefield. I'm going to give you six reasons why they are awesome and things they have over or in preference to, or should we say advantages over pole arms. But just before I go into that, just to set a little bit of context, the primary swords that we're looking at for this period, so I'm focusing on the 15th century, but you could extrapolate this to the 13th, 14th um, century. I will mention earlier centuries a little bit as well, um, and indeed through to the 16th century. Things start to change a bit in the 17th uh, due to uh, gunpowder and various other things. But there are three main swords uh, in this period that we're looking at. So most famously gets dealt with an awful lot on the internet, the long sword, so uh, a type of two-handed or hand-and-a-half sword, okay, so a sword that can be used in one hand, not particularly well, depending on the sword in question, uh, but primarily a two-handed sword, and obviously that has relations in the big two-handed swords, which we're not going to go into here. 
We've got the good old one-handed arming sword, which obviously comes in many, many different types and many varieties and has been around since uh, the Roman era, really late Roman era, um, uh, via the Viking era, migration era, Viking era, and uh, the later medieval period. And then also forms of, should we call them Langmesser and also Falchion, so single-edged or predominantly single-edged swords. They might have a false edge up here in the case of this particular example. But essentially, uh, they, they are more choppy boys. <laughs> so we've got uh, cut and thrust swords, and we've got, these are cut and thrust swords as well, uh, but perhaps a little bit more geared towards more powerful cutting. Um, and, uh, and then we've got uh, longer variants that can be used with two hands. And obviously there are other types of medieval sword, there are other relations of these, but generally speaking, those are the sorts of medieval swords that you might be talking about. Some of them are used with shields, some with bucklers, some not at all by themselves. Some of them, just because they're one-handed swords, doesn't mean they're always used with something else. One-handed swords were sometimes used by themselves as well, by people like archers, for example, um, who couldn't necessarily carry a shield around, and not all of them carried bucklers. Um, the pole arms in question, well, I did a massive pole arm video. If you haven't watched that already, please go and check that out. If you just search in my videos for uh, pole weapon or pole arm. And... Um, they come in many, many different varieties. Obviously, the most famous and predominant pole weapon is the good old spear. This is actually not a typical example, of course. This is a winged spear with a kind of hewing spear with a particularly long uh, blade on it. Um, and they come in many different lengths, all the way up to pike length. Most spears are usually about 10 foot long. Uh, which is not dissimilar to a cavalry lance as well, we used on horseback or in foot. Um, and then we've got forms of more specialised cutting weapons, particularly popular in the 15th century. Things like the bill and the halberd, which are, I say, function fairly similar. They can chop, they can spike or hook, and they can thrust like a spear, but they are therefore heavier because they've got bigger heads, they're not as nimble as a spear. So you've got more options, as I always point out on my channel, what you gain, here you lose somewhere else, so you gain more versatility, more chopping power, more hooking options, all this kind of stuff, but you pay for that with weight, and so this is a heavier, more cumbersome weapon, it's not as nimble as a spear. Um, and then you've got various other things like glaives and um, other forms of weapon that are fundamentally combinations of cutting, spiking, hooking, and still, in most cases, still having the spear's capacity to thrust. Now. I don't want to undermine pole arms. Pole arms are awesome, and the main reason we make so many videos talking about um, swords is because swords are hugely popular, so we have to counterbalance that with the, uh, the myth-busting thing of going, hey, you know, so swords are really cool, but let's not forget about these guys over here, the pole arms, and yay, they deserve uh, lots of medals for what they have achieved on battlefields going all the way back into prehistory. But, this is where swords come in. Swords are still super important. Okay, so we're now going to look at those six reasons. Um, and swords certainly did kill a lot of people in history and were used an awful lot alongside pole arms and alongside missile weapons. So let's look at these six reasons. And remember, the last one, the sixth, is what I consider really by far the most important reason why these were so important in medieval warfare. So I'm going to rattle through the first five of these, and you've heard probably all of these before on my channel, um, so no need to go into too much depth on any, any of them. So the first really, really important reason why swords are so important is because they are sidearms. You can wear them anywhere, okay? So via a scabbard, they are super safe and easy to wear. Once the blade is in a scabbard, it's completely enclosed. You can't stab anyone with it. You can't cut anyone with it. You can wear that conveniently and almost forget that it's there with a good scabbard and suspension system. So they are sidearms, much like a pistol or much like a pocket knife. They can, they, as long as you're legally allowed to, they can be with you anywhere, anytime. On a horse, on foot, sitting down, standing up, running, swimming even. Um, so they can literally be with you, regardless of what your hands are doing, regardless of whether you're operating you know, a, a bow or a pole arm or climbing a ladder or opening a door or making something or riding a horse or doing anything else, they can be with you. So super important, they are omnipresent. Now the next um, advantage and special thing that swords have to them, which pole arms don't always have, is that, and this is probably not thought of by lots of people, they are basically all metal. Okay, they've got some wood and leather on the grip, um, but that is a fairly minor part of the construction, and even if the grip falls apart, the, the guard and the pommel still stay where they are if the sword's constructed properly. So, um, 
By and large, this is a fully metallic weapon. Now, most pole arms, if we take a spear as probably the most extreme example, is a very long amount of wood and a small amount of steel at the end. That means that it's potentially perishable. Now, that's not to say that swords are indestructible. As I pointed out in previous videos, swords can and do break. And in fact, if we look at medieval art and accounts, we find plenty of examples of sword blades breaking. But that being said, they are overall much more durable than a spear is. A spear shaft can, not with one blow, but can be cut through uh, with a few successive blows, can be broken, can be split. Lances usually, or at least many lances, break on impact, um, at, or they can be designed to break on impact. And if we look at things like bills and halberds, they often have what are called langettes. Um, particularly if we look at pole axes, we see pole axe pretty much always has langettes down the, uh, down the shaft. And that is partly to um, keep the head on if the shaft breaks and try and hold the shaft together, and partly also to protect the shaft from impacts and cuts and blows um, that might damage the shaft. So the simple fact is a pole weapon involves a pole, and a wooden shaft is more perishable on average in general than a steel, a tempered steel blade is. Uh, so swords are pretty durable. Now the next advantage that I don't think can be uh, understated actually is that blades of swords are rather difficult to grab and grapple. Now that's not to say that it wasn't done. In fact if we look at the treatises and in fact um, descriptive accounts of duels and combat scenes and everything else whether we're looking all the way back into the medieval period or all the way up to the 19th century there are actually plenty of accounts of people grabbing blades. Yes this is a sharp blade, yes I am holding it by its blade. Oh my hand is not cut and it's not fallen off. Okay they're not lightsabers, they're not magical but they are, relatively speaking, harder to safely grab, certainly when someone's trying to kill you with the thing and stabbing and cutting and doing all this kind of stuff at you. Um, they are harder to try and oppose this lever uh, than something like a spear or a bill. The simple fact is that, yeah, you know, we talk about all the huge advantages that pole arms have of leverage and reach and everything else. And the fact that you can put your two hands further apart and you can slide the hands and you can do different things, you can use the back end and all this kind of stuff. So pole arms do have plenty of advantages. But if you are fighting against a pole arm, including bayonets, incidentally, bayonets on the end of a rifle or a musket, what is the main advice to the person who's trying to use a sword? Well, you know, first of all, you're at a disadvantage. They've got a leverage and a, a weight and a length advantage, a reach advantage. But if you're using the sword, primarily you want to get past that point, you want to close into close distance, and you want to grab and control the opponent's weapon. And the simple fact is that pole arms, because they're made of a really long handle, surprise, surprise, a really long handle is quite good to grab. And not only is it good for the user to grab, it's good for the opponent to grab as well. So I'm not saying that it's easy to grab pole arms. I'm not saying that it's impossible to grab swords or anything like that. We know neither of those things are exactly true. But in relative terms, it is easier to grab. And once you've grabbed, hang on to and control and keep hold of a pole arm than it is a sword. And funnily enough, this is even mentioned as late as uh, Fairbairn's um, dagger stuff, World War II Commando whereby the edge is not on the commando dagger, is not described necessarily as being used to cut, um, not primarily anyway, uh, but it is described as being good as an anti-grabbing device, because if someone's trying to stab you, if you can grab and control the blade, good. If it's got edges on it, it makes it more difficult to do. Not impossible at all, uh, but more difficult and more harmful to do. So, swords, harder to grab than pole arms. So number four of my um, six points of why swords are so awesome and in some ways better than pole arms is that these are very quick and nimble things and are particularly effective against unarmoured people. So if we're in a civilian self-defence situation, the fact is that to deploy one of these from its scabbard, because remember you can carry it anywhere and you can pull it out, and obviously just to, I know this isn't medieval European, but just to switch over, when people talk about sword drawing they obviously, um, I think quite famously think of the attacks which come straight in uh, Iaido, for example, in Iai, uh, from with a katana um, in Japanese swordsmanship. Um, but this does absolutely apply to European swordsmanship as well, and if we look at the 15th and 16th century treatises, we do indeed see with uh, one-handed swords and two-handed swords, we do see self-defense 
uh, attacks straight from the scabbard uh, deployed. Usually they're edged down in Europe, uh, but nevertheless we see sometimes them coming straight out to defend. And this is sometimes known as Prem, uh, this position uh, in certain later rapier treatises. So one of the first positions you get to from drawing the sword out is here, which means that the sword is in front of you ready to defend or, or indeed from there to launch an attack. And um, we do see, as I say in the treatises, we do see defences against daggers and other things where the person starts out with the sword and the scabbard. So they're quick to deploy and once they're out, they are quick and nimble. And in addition to that, remember that a sword is edged and pointed all around, unlike a polearm, okay? So if you're close to someone and you swing a polearm, you might push them slightly with the shaft, you're not going to injure them, okay? Not, not really anyway, other than a bruise. Um, yeah, absolutely using it like a pugil stick or like quarter staffs are used in old Robin Hood films, which isn't how quarter staffs are normally used. Um, using it like that, yeah, absolutely, you can, you can batter someone around. But the simple fact is that this sword is quick and nimble to deploy, quicker and more nimble in a close um, environment than the pole weapon. And once it's out, it is edged all around. So essentially these are very good in self-defense and they are very quick to deploy and very nimble. So that's a major plus for the sword. Now number five, before we get to number six, which remember is the absolutely main point of this video, uh, number five is to do with hand protection. Now I often make a point about how medieval swords actually don't have very much hand protection compared to later sabres or um, side swords or rapiers or things like this, or even later, uh, you know, 16th century um, forms of uh, cross-hilted sword which have things like side rings on them for example um, sometimes you know knuckle bows and so on and so forth medieval swords in general although we start to get the early form of side sword which I've done a recent video about in the 15th century most medieval swords don't have an awful lot of hand protection but compared to pole arms they do okay uh, for a couple of reasons number one you've got a cross guard okay some indeed uh, are kind of s-shaped some indeed have a knocker bow and so on and so forth uh, if we look at the langmesser you've additionally got the nuggle at the side there which protects the side when you're binding against an opponent's blade uh, and at the end of the 15th century we get side rings and stuff like that as well but um Relatively to a pole arm, they have a lot of hand protection, or at least most pole arms. I'll talk about that in a second. Because, of course, in a pole arm, you've got most of the time you've got nothing really to protect your hands except for the length of the weapon itself. In some cases, you have lugs or you have projecting sideways bars, which do essentially protect the hand to some degree, uh, but in close combat, you don't have an awful lot to protect the hands. And a lot of people go, oh, well, gauntlets. Well, funnily enough, a lot of people using pole arms didn't use gauntlets for numerous reasons. Um, now, the caveat to this that I want to mention is some pole arms do have specific hand protection, and examples being glaives and pole axes most commonly. You occasionally find it on other things like halberds and, and um, other forms of pole arm, uh, al piece and stuff, stuff like this. But generally speaking, you can have a disc. In the 15th century, you have a disc, uh, usually uh, kind of up towards the top of the shaft here. And yes, that can be some form of hand protection, but remember, on the pole arm, you have got so much handle that you can't effectively put a hand guard on here because you need to be able to move your hands around on the shaft to be able to use both ends of the weapon for different purposes and at different ranges. Um, so, and because your hands are spread out, they're essentially kind of a bigger target and something can slide along that pole and hit you in the hands. So if you're not wearing gauntlets, the hands are more vulnerable. So. I would say overall that's a plus for swords, is a better degree of hand protection. So finally we get to point six, and this I believe is the absolute most important point for why swords were so important on the medieval battlefield. And I'm gonna put it under one heading, but under that one heading it actually splits off into several different points. And now that one heading is close fighting or close combat. Okay, so it should be relatively um, obvious to most of you that shorter weapons are more effective at close range. Okay, if you're using a knife, you need to be close to someone. If you're wanting to use a spear effectively, you need to be relatively further away from someone. If you're using a missile weapon like a bow, crossbow, or a firearm, Ideally, you want to be even further away from a person. Now, that's not to say that weapons can't be used at different ranges. You can throw a sword, uh, you can throw a knife or an axe, of course. 
And um, additionally, you can use spears at close range. And in fact, um, there are techniques in the treatises and descriptive accounts whereby we know that whilst you might ideally want to be using your spear at spear range, okay, over here, if a person does knock your point aside and come in close, you've got a few options. One of those options being to draw back your point and use it at closer range. Another option being to use the middle of your um, pole to push away. This is not very good in defensive terms, but can buy you distance to then get the person into hitting or thrusting distance again. This is used in poleaxe combat in armour. So if I'm fully encased in armour and the other person is, and the person knocks my point on my head of my poleaxe aside, I can shove them away with the middle and then use one of the ends of my weapon. And the other option is, of course, to use the back end of the weapon. And so if you're a more lightly armoured person, you don't have armour or much armour protecting you, and your point gets knocked aside by charging swordsmen, indeed you can bring the back end around and try and get them with the back end, either with a thrust or a hit. So indeed, pole, arm, pole arms can be used at close range, but <laughs> the simple fact is that pole arm versus sword, we usually say that pole arms have the advantage. That's because you're fighting at the pole arms range. Okay, so if it's spearman versus swordsman, if my opponent has a spear and I'm approaching them, I have to get through their range before I can get to my range. That's why pole arms have the advantage. Okay. Once I'm into my range, I have the advantage. So, first thing to set in your mind is that at close, at sword range, the sword is literally a better weapon than the spear or polearm. Okay, but the problem is you have to get through their range, you have to get through the halberd or spear or bill's range to get to your range. And that's the difficult bit. Doing that without dying is really difficult. Unless, and this is where we come into the nitty gritty of it now, Unless there's something that enables you to cross that range, either while defending more effectively, or being able to take hits and not die. Now, let's think. What allows you to close distance more safely, or what allows you to not die when you're hit? <sighs> Ta-da! <laughs> armour! <laughs> so, if we have armour, and it doesn't have to be a full plate cuirass, um, it could be a brigandine, or it could be a um, male shirt, or whatever, or indeed, if you've got a shield, okay? And I've pointed this out before, when we've, particularly when we've been talking about the Romans. So a lot of people go, oh, well, the primary weapon of the Romans was the gladius. Not really. <laughs> the only reason that the, that the sidearm of the, of the Romans was the gladius was because they had the scutum, the really big shield. If they weren't using the scutum, they wouldn't use the gladius. They're a set. They go together. So, uh, and this is true of basically all warfare. So the simple fact is that whilst I always say that pole arms are primary weapons and very, very important on the battlefield, even used with shields or without shields, in both scenarios, both can work very, very effectively. The simple fact is that when you bring shields or armor into the mix, it changes things. And quite simply, if we're looking, at, now I said we focus on the 15th century, but I said I'd mention earlier centuries and here you go. If we're talking about the Battle of Hastings, 1066, if I've got a kite shield and I've got a male shirt and a helmet, then my ability to close down that spearman is vastly increased over just having a sword or a sword and buckler or something like this, because I'm able to hide behind the shield as I close in to sword distance. Once I'm at sword distance, this is a better weapon than the spear. Okay, it's more nimble, it's fully edged, it's more robust, it's more able to get in angles that I can't do with a spear. I don't have a back end sticking out of it, which gets in the way with a spear. So uh, well, yes, whilst the spear might be very effective at thrusting, stabbing over a shield, because it's got the back end sticking around, it's more cumbersome, it's bigger, and it's gonna get in the way of my body if I'm trying to move around here. However, when I've got a sword and a shield, I know these are weird combination, this is a 15th century and this is 11th century, but um, you get the basic idea. If I've got a sword and a shield, I can get my sword round all weird angles, even round here, that I'm cutting, of course, and thrusting, that I just simply can't do with a pole arm. So, with a shield, or with armour, so if we talk about the 15th century again, imagine you've got uh, two knights who are armed with 
spears, but they're also fully plated head to foot in plate armor and in the gaps, they've got mail. <laughs> Um, their faces are fully enclosed in visors and so on. So where are you going to stick your spear? The fact is at spear range, yes, you can try and get the spear into a gap. Your spear might be super effective against those very lightly armed billmen or uh, archers or crossbowmen or whatever over there. But against this knight in front of you, where are you going to put your spear tip? The chances are it's going to glance off the armor as your opponent closes in to basically grappling range. Now at grappling range, it's interesting because swords and daggers can still very effectively be used at grappling range. I can be wrestling with someone and still getting my sword in, or I can be using it in half sword in here to get into armpits and stuff, which I can't do with a pole arm. And in fact, if you look at pole axes, that's, that is the main reason why a pole axe is usually about this long, can be about as tall as a person, but they're often a little bit shorter. Pole axe is about this long instead of the that high of a spear or a halberd or a bill because they're for completely different jobs. So I consider this the absolute main reason why these swords were so important, not just in the medieval period, of course, but going back into the uh, migration era, all the way back to Roman period as well. Yes, spears and pole arms are very, very effective used with a shield or without a shield. Uh, and in fact, due to their added leverage and size and weight, they can be very effective against armor sometimes as well. Hitting someone in the head, even if they're fully plated with a bill, can take them down just from percussive force alone. Uh, if you're using something like a pole axe of various forms of large war hammer with a spike on the back, it might even penetrate certain types of armor, it might pe penetrate certain brigandines, even some plate armor. So the simple fact is that yes, pole arms are incredibly important. They've got extra range. They can counter cavalry. They can use, be used, of course, by cavalry or on foot. Um, and they can be, they're incredibly versatile, incredibly important weapons. So I don't want to undermine the importance of uh, pole arms. But in the myth busting that we've been doing to kind of point out why swords are not so amazing, I think sometimes people watching my channel and other channels like it, can sometimes swing in the opposite direction and say, oh, what even swords, are, what are swords even for? They're useless. And as always, guys, it's not black and white. There's all, everything's shades of gray, okay? Um, and the fact is that we know throughout history, swords have been super important. So we have to ask ourselves, why have swords been super important? Now I've listed six reasons in this video, but really that number six one I think is the most important. And that's what I want to conclude with, that really in most close in melees and skirmishes and if their armor or shields are involved, or just it's just a typical battle that end up with two groups of people squished together and they don't have space to use their pole arms, swords at that distance are still effective and daggers and knives also are. So the simple fact is don't always think about a one-on-one -on -one dueling situation uh, in, in, a, in your HEMA club or whatever, or even if, if you do LARP or reenactment or something like that. A fight's not ended by a touch, usually. Um, and also in battlefield situations, there are usually shields involved, there are usually armor of various levels and technologies involved. And in that situation, it might take multiple hits to take an opponent down. And you might be doing it at very close range, much closer range than you can actually deploy these large pole weapons. I hope this has been a useful and entertaining video. Thanks a lot for watching, and I hope to see you back on the channel again really soon. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.